Okay, so we, we are beginning this evening's experience. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just playing this piece of music, and I kind of wanted to... Oh, well, so I thought there'd be a bunch of people that really didn't know me, but now... <laughs> I'm still so, figured you out. <laughs> I'll forget everything I know. Of you. <laughs> Do you want anything to drink? No, I'm fine I'm right I'm now. Fine, but... <laughs> yeah, but I was going to talk about, like, the gallery, how the gallery arrived here. Cool. Right. I guess I can do that anyways in spite of myself. So um, about five years ago, I was looking for a place to have a to show my work, and all the places that I liked said don't apply here. And then <laughs> all the places that I didn't like but were willing to take me said it's twenty five hundred dollars, and you know, and then we get sixty percent of the commission. So I was like, so Sarah and I were thinking, well, we could make some space down here, and you could put your work up. I could put my work up, and it would be sort of a you know, there's nobody that. There's not a lot of people who come in here. We don't draw a lot of attention to my paintings, so we're not like gallery people per se. We're just the kind of people who like to make a bunch of paintings and throw them in the closet and wonder what to do with them. <laughs> um, so, so anyway, so we do have occasional shows here, and an upcoming show is uh, going to feature three alumni. Uh, one of them is present tonight, and the other two are people that I went to art school with. Um, and the show's called Lineage, and it's gonna, we're going to hang it in uh, May through June of 2019. So that's kind of like looking forward for it. Cool. But yeah, so it's going to be Scott, my friend Miles, and another friend Brian Hoy, and we're just going to all do drawings. It's going to be graphite. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and until then, I just kind of like keep shifting my paintings. As I get a new painting, I kind of bring it down. And, Russell and Marilyn and I practice in here, and Russell, <laughs> and he looks at my painting and goes, that's nice, that's nice. So, oh, my yeah. good. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Russell. I, I do appreciate that very much. Um, so this piece of music that I was just playing, I kind of didn't know where to put this in the talk, but I think that right now is a good place to do it. And what it is, it's, um, it's four musicians. Scott recorded it. It's called Sound 224. And I play a lot of music with Scott, and his Portland friends, and we usually play folk music, and music that people can, you know, they know it's going to be like three or four chord changes. So what happened with this music is when I get together with my friend Frank, it's just like he doesn't want to do any of that stuff, and he's pretty much arrhythmic, and he just wants to make a lot of noise with his guitar. <laughs> and and it's and when Frank first came back, he lived in um, California for uh, 10 years, I think, San Francisco. And I hadn't seen him for a long time, and he called me up when we got back, and he said, Hey, Freeman, I got this house. Bring your guitar, and we'll play. And so we had a mutual friend, and this guy would lend Frank his houses to play in. And we played. Um, I went up there, and Frank was just playing this crazy stuff, and I'd never heard, I'd never seen anything like it. I just was totally unfamiliar with it. And I caught on, and I remember one time where I was there at this house that was full of, it was all furnished, it was a really beautiful house, and me and Frank had this big living room, and there was big stand-up basses and pianos. And seven hours later, um, I came out and I was like totally transformed. I've had this experience of just like, I'd never been in that space before. And Frank really provoked that. And so I got a taste for it. And, and Scott got another picture. <laughs> I've never been the no, same. <laughs> so anyway, so this is, to go right to it, I'm gonna just play a little bit of a sequence here. You can see what I mean. There's not any real structure or anything. And this happened last uh, February. <laughs> So it's a keyboard player and three guitar players. And Scott was recording. I did some feedback. So, um, Amber so, just walked in, let her oh, come and sit. Um, so, after, we, after that evening, um, when you play music like this, it can be so liberating. And, and you know, I was doing, uh, when I was painting a lot, um, I was driving home, and the experience of a shared experience like that, where you don't really have a structure, but you have some sort of communication that is so apparent to each other. 
and it's significant only in that moment, and then Scott Hap, you can come sit down here. Um, this is my daughter. Where is the scene? She's got a scene. I won't play the music for you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> she was playing in her car on the way over. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I was so enthralled and enraptured because like, it, 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 it gave me an insight to painting that I didn't have. And it was like just this free form thing. Like when I would play a note, Frank would uh, respond immediately with something that was totally unexpected and it, seemingly irrelevant, but it was so inspiring that I, I was like, wow, that, I, you, you, it's kind of like when you're doing harmonies with people and you go to a different place, it's kind of like you have that kind of a religious type of experience, I think. And this was very much like that. So then when I got home, um, the, the morning after, I, I remember I just jumped up and I went into my studio. And at the, the last moment when Scott had recorded that, um, Scott's, I think he's saying, what should I name that? What should I name that? And Frank just said, Psalm 224. And it was just kind of random. And it resonated with me so well. So what I did was, there's a painting behind Noah, and it is, it's called Psalm 224. And I was able to, when I went into my studio, I, uh, I tried to recall that same emotional um, plane that I was on when I was playing with those guys. And I, I approached that painting the same way. And it was just, I, I just remember how exhilarated that I was that I, I could have that feeling in me and I could be inspired like that. So, um, all right, so let's get that out of the way. <laughs> and now I have a slideshow. So, um, some of you people know that I live way out in the woods, but some of you don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, to the extent of which, how far out in the woods that we actually live. Um, <laughs> I know. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> so anyway, so the woods have, so ever since I was a little kid, the woods have been very important to me, very significant. My father um, took me out in the woods a lot. He loved the woods, and he, I, we hunted, and we, we, we just like to go for walks and and study nature um, uh, in a very way lay lay way, and um, so I've always been I've always loved the woods. And when I started to paint, um, I started to turn to nature and the woods. And when I was about fourteen years old, where we presently live, um, I used to go trout fishing. There's a little brook behind where we currently live, and I used to go trout fishing there and it was a little hill and when I was 14 one day I took an axe out there and I cut down a bunch of logs and um, I started to build a lot of cap and um, it was actually only two logs and they were very heavy and I realized <laughs> but, it, but it was still a lot of cabin to me in my mind and so when I got older um, I happened to be talking to my aunt one day about this place and I said well I was just over in the woods for a walk and um, I've come across this old log cabin that I built two logs and she said oh well that's my property you can just keep building that place if you want and I was like wow really so so I did I started we, I built a painting studio there when I was in art school and then I met Sandra and we transformed it into our home so I feel like this place has a, a long lineage it goes back to me but it even goes back further as it was in my family's property and the river that goes through our property is called the Josias River which was named after Josias Littlefield who um, was my 11th great grandfather and his father was the founder of Wells. So when I'm out on this property, I have this real sense of, the, of belonging and place, um, which is kind of strange. Um, but nonetheless, I have it. And um, so this is a picture of the Josias River. And it's a little, it's not very large. If you, if you haven't been doing the fishing, you've probably been. So um, what I a lot of times what I do is I I go into the woods like in the, I haven't been doing it lately but when the weather was more conducive I go for a walk in the morning and I go through and I either take a drawing pad or um, my camera and I love to take I love to do both so a lot of times I'm torn and sometimes I'll actually take both but then it becomes so cumbersome and I get so um, over exhilarated I can't stand it so I try to reduce my weight. <laughs> And I take one or the other. So, um, 
So I think I so what I figured was I would just start out with my photos first, and then I'll work into my drawings, and then a few paintings, and then perhaps we can discuss what the idea of this talk was, which is um, the finished work. And as I've accumulated all of these, it's kind of like wow, I've got a lot of paintings <laughs> and a lot of photographs, and I and I really love to do it, and so. <laughs> So what, I, so what I really like to do is, like, when I take my camera, is I love to, I, lo I, I don't really know what, um, my, my, I, I kind of developed this kind of like a, a relationship with, the, with nature, especially the nature that's around where I live. And it's become very special and intimate. And, and a lot of times I think I, I should go someplace else because I'm spending too much time here. But I'm so compelled just to keep going back because of my familiarity. <laughs> And then when I find a place that isn't familiar with, to me, I'm even kind of like, wow, I'm even more, I'm stupefied that I've never seen this place before. So this, I'm still discovering all these little like lost treasures or um, things that maybe shouldn't be discovered. But um, so I love to take my camera and just um, just frame something in and give myself permission to take a photo of it, and without in a, in a knowing way, I try to I try to find some sort of an emotion that I feel like that, that charges me enough to, to click the shutter. And, <clears throat> and I have all sorts of preconceived ideas and I have all sorts of ideas about composition and the way things work and stuff. But ultimately what I try to do is I try to, I try to be introspective and, find, and, and, and identify the sensation that I'm feeling when I'm in the woods. And then I try to aspire to capture that, realizing that with a camera it's impossible. Um, no matter how good your camera is, um, it just only captures one aspect of the experience. And, you know, the senses are also deprived. So, like, when I see this, I would also be delighted by all of the smells and the decay and stuff. Um, so the photograph becomes just, just one aspect of expressing that experience. Um, and it's great. <clears throat> and sometimes you can capture things that you didn't expect to capture. Like the other day I took this picture and it was Saturday to pour and I was kind of leaning over my camera so it wouldn't get wet. And I, this was on a path. And then I just looked and I saw all those ringlets and I just took the picture and I was like, wow, that's right there. So, I, so sometimes there's these little unexpected um, things that happen too. And then as you'll see, eventually um, I have... I, when I go, when I, what, the, what nature also gives me is this... I don't know, it's like nature, it, it, it's kind of like, it says, it doesn't say anything, but it's there if you want it, and if you don't, you can take a walk and never even realize what's around you, you can be so caught up in your own thoughts, and then, and then you can also go out and you can be totally overwhelmed by the beauty, just the, the significance of the beauty of, of what's in front of you, and sometimes then, even if you turn around, it's like even over, it's more overwhelming than beautiful, um, so... When I take my camera, sometimes I'll be working on drawings or paintings, and I try to keep my pictures ahead of my drawings and paintings in that I try to, I try to give myself more permission to feel okay about taking pictures and going into a new place and, and being okay with how that something, something might catch my attention and that I feel like it's significant enough to take that picture. The other thing is, you, you know, I take a lot of pictures now, so... I probably take like 10 or 15 pictures of this and then I bracket and I do five to seven brackets per. So I have a lot more, um, when I was putting the slideshow together, I really had to edit and, and I'm not, this won't take that long. Um, <clears throat> and then you also have like, you know, the bokeh effect. So you've got things in the foreground that are sharp. And if you take a, a sharp, if you take a fast, uh, if your f-stop is, is low, it's gonna make everything in the background blurry, which isn't natural natural at all. But then it's like, wow, it's compelling to do that because of the, just the, the way that the photograph works that way. So, and a lot of times I'll just go and I'll, I'll, I'll just sit quietly and, and not try to force anything to happen, but just kind of like be present. And then sometimes you just, you know, just look. And this was an example of that where these were shadows cast by some ferns. And it was just on a log right next to me. And I was, I was like, wow, that's just really, it, it, it was so unusual to see that. And it was in perfect focus with the, with the sun. Yeah, they don't even look like shadows. Yeah. <clears throat> So 
And then these are then then I this is I think of this as kind of like a primal image to me. It's like it, it it's only what it. I really, I really don't know how to explain it, but but it's something that I find to be very compelling is that um, <clears throat> uninterrupted. Just it, it's a. I feel like it is primal. I guess I won't try to say too much about it. And I did crop all of these images up until now because um, the computer, the TV screen is uh, ten twenty by nineteen. 1080 by 1920, and otherwise something would get cropped off or I'd have black on the edges. So um, these look, the, when I was cropping them, I was realizing, wow, these are um, even more different being cropped. So this this one day, I just like this picture. I just thought, um, one day I was sitting waiting for something to happen, and this little deer walked up in front of me and <clears throat> started browsing and didn't see I was there. <laughs> He's probably on somebody's table right now. <laughs> This is a really old um, ash tree. It's probably about two or three hundred years old. It blew over last year during a windstorm, oh. and um, <clears throat> and it just and it shattered when it when it when it broke off the top. It was so old and hollow inside. It just it just like burst apart. And I there's like there's lots of different really interesting dynamic views of this. And this is one of my favorite um, things to do. We have a, a swamp um, in one direction, and the, there are these little maple trees that are about six to eight inches in diameter, and they just they grow to that size, and then they just they must be overwhelmed by the water, and they just fall over and die. So there's not any large trees down there, and all of this moss is growing up on them, and, and the the swamp grasses and the foliage behind. Um, <clears throat> I can just I can just go down there and just look at this and be totally astonished by it. And then you know when you go you point the camera at it, it's a totally different experience. It's like an interruption to that that sort of engagement, uh, the, the harmony. Looks like that famous Marguerite. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yes, the negative of the trees, but the the forest is actually in the in the tree. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's, it's very reminiscent. Of Natural. Yeah, this was a scene that I came upon last winter, and it was after a nice snowstorm. I'd gotten like I don't know, eight or ten or something inches, um, but I was—I didn't need snowshoes, uh, so it was probably like eight inches. And um, so the sun had come out, and all the snow was melting off the branches, and it was just—it was just falling down in front of me, and. I had my tripod and I just started taking pictures, but the experience of being there was just, it was like totally awesome. It was like, and it was like, it was my place. I, it was like, if I wasn't there, I, I, it was one of those things in life that you have, it was almost like a life experience. Um, <clears throat> and here I am with my camera trying to capture that. This is there's a power line that goes through a property and blueberry bushes with some terrible thing that they say is completely natural. And <clears throat> this little this little foliage and these berries on the top were just um, were just growing. You know, it was kind of weird. I mean, otherwise just barren, dead zone. Mm -hmm. This is like a poplar tree that the bark had fallen up and it was laying down on the forest floor. And, um, I, I came upon it and I was like, well, I don't want to draw like that. <laughs> that's the, uh, that's the Josiah's River behind the, the horizontal branches. Does anybody know what this is? It's a species? Oh, species. It, well, I, we just got on a nature walk up to Mount A with a local historian, and he told us that there's only one tree that blossoms in the fall, and that is witch hazel. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, wow, I never knew that. And so I came home, and I was taking a walk, and there was a tree stand on one side of a property, and I climbed up the tree stand. And um, 
it was this branch in my face, and I went to break it off, and it was this witch hazel, and I was like, whoa. And then I re- then it was all around, and I lived, I've been out there for so many years, and I never knew the witch hazel grew up there. And I think the blossoms had just fallen off. Um, but those were like the, the cups or whatever for the blossoms. Um, here's this one I, I saw that the uncropped version was much more preferable. So th- this is the crop version that I did to put it so it fit on the, the screen, but this is the uncropped version. <coughs> These are um, reflections in the water down at the river. And I thought that they were like with the fast shutter speed, but they're really, they weren't, they were like a thousand. Or, I don't know, you guys are the shutter speeds. Yeah. Uh, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, is this recent? No, it's like last, last spring. But you, did, you put it on social media. Yeah, I was going through these and I was like, whoa, I love these. Yeah. I like these too much. They're so... Um, too much. Yeah, they're, they're so... Well, because because you can get them so easy. You're like, <laughs> my art. you just go down and you just click away. And it's like, I'm going to show... I've got like five or six here. And they're just... Um, wow. They're unbelievable to me. Um, so it's like... It's, like I said, it's too easy. It reminds me of stuff that Joanne Arnold does in Portland. Yeah, she does that. It's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you use that's incredible. So yeah, this was, I think it was, I looked at the exif on this and it was like 300, it was 350th of a second, which, oh, you know, my camera's at the 5,000. And I thought that was, I, I don't know what I was doesn't look like a problem. I mean. Yeah, I know. These are like, this was, uh, it's a 16, 1 16, so January 1960. 20 Because <laughs> <laughs> that's what it can Can I just say, what is the sound I hear? Is that the radio? I think there's some music playing. Yeah, you want to make sure that? No. Did you want it playing? No, I, I meant to turn it off. I'll turn it off. Sorry. So this is a 14 by 17? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so I, I'm trying to think. So my drawings have always been really, I really love to draw. I just, um, I've always really loved to draw, uh, maybe more than I love to paint. And drawing kind of like leads me forward in a much more um, quicker way than painting does because it's just so, you know, I, and just zip these things out. And what I do is I, it's kind of like when I take the photograph, I watch for my, I, I, I kind of try to sink into some sort of an emotional experience with them and I sort of create my own little world where that I feel like this is talking to me, this is saying something. And with drawings, I can, I can usually like, I can, I'm pretty adept at, um, for myself to be able to just work on these things, and then it's there's this moment of where it becomes immensely exciting that you know you're watching as you're as you're drawing one line. By the way, these are just out of my these ones are just out of my imagination. I'm not using anything for reference. To you, if you didn't know that, um, and so but but I'll just you know I'll make a pen mark and or I use a brush or uh, mostly brushes, and I just watch. And as I'm making my brush strokes, I watch the whole surface just change it just alters in front of me and it's like it's, it's really uh, i just really like doing that i also like drawing from nature and there'll be some of those coming up too 
But these, these, um, these help me to understand how to break up the plane or how to make my, I, I try actually not to, to follow any <coughs> standards or rules of composition. I try to break them continuously. Um, um, so, but nonetheless, it, it is a vehicle to be able to work within if you try to, you know, use the surface. Um, mm -hmm. Now is that, okay. These are the same. These are a, a friend of mine, a poet, an acquaintance of mine, who just passed away. Um, and he written this a poem about his wife called. Um, it was called Rose. And mm. after I read it, I just, I just, I just did these. And there, it was. They, it helped to liberate me because before this, I was going outside and drawing a lot. And then I just realized that you know everything that I. I want to say is already within me, so if it's cold out, I don't really need to go out. I just have a cup of coffee and stay inside and draw. Whoops. So these, these are like, you know, they're really just um, fun. And like with the preceding one, I always try to make it, I, make, I try to make it a closer I, uh, expression of my, um, of me. And it's kind of like, that's, that's what I, I continuously try to practice is to um, somehow express my uniqueness. Um, and so I'm like, here I'm really down to just like, using a brush and water and letting the, the, the ink just kind of drip and flow. Um, and I might blow on the pools or something of the, of the wet ink. Um, but trying to do minimal and just watch what happens and then respond to that in a way, in, in, in as open-minded as I can without having any preconceptions of what I'm doing. And at the same time, I'm looking at a lot of Rembrandt drawings. So I have Rembrandt books on the table. And, uh, you know, he, he was doing all these merchants and these guys in the street, and just these great little, really simple wash drawings that are just so beautiful. And so I, I find looking at his drawings to be very compelling as I'm doing this. And sometimes I'll actually zip in a little guy um, with a cane or something in the corner. I don't think there are any ones here. <clears throat> So I think around like this time I started to have this, um, I wanted to go out in the woods and draw. I, and I do go out in the woods and I, and I plain air paint, but um, I felt like, I, I kept thinking, I just want to go out and draw. So there's a few more here and we're going to get into the woods. I said I put some color. The problem with these drawings is, you know, I can do like 10 or 15 in like an hour. And um, I use sketchbooks. I leave the tags on the side so you can tell if that's done in the sketchbook. <clears throat> and these things really just pile up. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so here we're in the woods. So finally I break away um, and, I'm, and I'm in my element. Now I'm like, okay, this is where I really want to be with my sketchbook. And I don't know what to do because the woods are so complex. It's like, if you can imagine those photographs that we just looked at and the amount of detail, and then you go out there and you start to edit these things. Um, and you say, you know, what kind of, what, what do you want, what are you even trying to do? What are you trying to accomplish? It's like, it's just impossible. The impossibilities are like, well, well help me. So then I start with one mark. And, you know, I'm looking at John Senior Sargent and his watercolors in the woods, and I'm like, whoa, that guy was like, Really good. Um, and I don't, but I don't even want to be like that. I just want to be like, I want to, when I get done with the drawing, I just want to feel like I expressed something that was very unique to me. Um, or I revealed something that was really unique to me. 
And so I think that what I decided to do is I decided to think, okay, I'm going to be able to do that through economy. And it's what I leave out that becomes, uh, it, possibly what I leave out that becomes relevant. And it makes the other part seem like that's what, what the content is. You have judiciously not shared some of these on social media. Yeah, I never show people these good <laughs> Scott told me that. Um, so th I think this was the first one I went out um, after doing all those drawings inside and just, you know, from my head. And this was a tree in the center, there's a tree trunk. And it's like, whoa, what? You know, I've got this ink brush and I've got black ink. And it's like, what do you do with this to, to convey this thing? And I knew there's all sorts of conventional ways to do that. And, you know, I went to art school, so I studied drawing and stuff. But nonetheless, where I was in my life right now it was like it was really perplexing because you know i just wanted to so i did here i just responded to it and it was like it was like the first uh, start where i felt like okay i i got i did that the nice thing about these is um they take me right back to where I was sitting. You know, I can feel the, the on this one. I can feel the warmth of the sun on my back, and I was sitting on a, a rock that was already heated by the sun. There was a little bit of moss on it, and it was the birds were just singing. And it was just a glorious day. Um, How much different is it from Kevin? Because you were explaining earlier with some of your um, some of your drawings that just came from your mind, and now you have subject matter we're using that medium <clears throat> like how different is that now that you have a, sort of a task in your mind of what you're looking to it I mean you are in your art but before it was so freestyle and now there's so much more structure but you're always trying to kind of push that envelope and see but you love nature so much that I feel like ingrained in you you know it has to be a specific way in some respects yeah yeah, yeah. and then there are drawings that I didn't put in here that don't look like these are identifiable, you know. Yeah. So it's interesting that like a lot of people like to have a narrative. It's like when they look at a painting, they like to go, "Oh, that's red," and, you know. So that, or you know, I see a tree over there, or whatever. And um, so that that's relevant. I think that no matter what. And then so, you know, when I'm out in the woods, I mean, I could elect to draw things that would describe something that's a woodsy, you know, that's not woodsy at all. Um, so I realize that I am describing a a, a landscape scene in the woods. And that, I found that to be compelling, whereas I wasn't doing that when I was doing them from my imagination. Um, but sometimes when I was drawing them, it would feel like I was creating a landscape. There are some of those ones back then that looked like it might be on, on a, in a vista or something. And, and so I would always let that happen, too. I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to, but yeah, I don't know um, if there's a... I think for me, what happens is, is that I get really excited about watching the drawing evolve regardless. And it's the same when I paint. It's like, you, know, you put a piece of color here, you put a, a black here, and you just watch the whole surface change. And so I think that that's what I like about drawing, is that opportunity and the potential to create something that you never knew. Like when I sit down in the woods here and I look out at this, I'm like, it's impossible. Right away, you can't even do anything. And then I start to make a mark, and then I... And then I have to, you have to really trust yourself. And you know this when you do your charms. Sure. You, you trust yourself and you go, okay, I think that that other tree is over here someplace and starts to make a mark. And then when it all starts to converge and fall together, it's just like, it's really exciting. Well, it's so funny to me, sorry, I don't mean to like be hogging up time, but even the, from the very beginning, the piece of music that you played, and it was just, like you mentioned, it was just a bunch of randomness and all this craziness. But it all worked. So like, I don't know if I'm crazy. But, no, I had a but like, I was listening to this and it doesn't just sound like a bunch of people playing mindlessly like there was clearly like intent with everything that was happening and I see it all in your work as well that maybe you didn't start with that intent but it all comes together somehow yeah. like I don't know isn't it kind of like a process of stripping down filters because <clears throat> basically what we see when we go into the woods you know it's, we've got our filters that are already pre-constructed this is a tree this is the woods this is I recognize this thing and then isn't the attempt to, when you, from what you're describing anyway, when you put something on paper or, or 
canvas or anything. But now you're exploring what does what does how does this move me, right? What does this? Yeah. And so you have to like pull away. You have to strip away. Yes, yeah. but, but you know the the brush really helps you strip it away because it's like it's just got some it's got black on it, right? Right. It's yeah. Like, that's, so that's kind of... and then the gray is this myriad. Uh, the tree is this myriad of just shades of beautiful values. You know, the whole way down is changing. As it's up toward the sky, it's dark, and it's down to the ground. It can be the lightest thing that there is. And, but you've got this one, this one mechanism to portray that, and it's like that's that's the the that's what's really cool. And then when you know you go back, and I love uh, John Singer Sargent's uh, watercolors. I don't know if you've seen it, if you're familiar with any of the stuff he does, like deer in the woods and the light. Uh, oh my god! You know? <laughs> and then I think, oh, I don't want to, but it's kind of like. He has a technique, so I, I try to stay away from that technique. I try to think, as soon as I start to get really adept at doing these, then I move on to something else because I realize that, that I can build up a skill level that will make these, that will make these kind of even you know, more rendered looking and that they would appeal to a, people that like that sort of thing. Whereas I, don't want, I just want to be like on the verge of these things not working, just kind of like falling apart. And when I when I finish it, I just want to feel that like thing like wow that that was a a, a unique accomplishment each time. Mm. Yeah, there's there's a lot of drawings where I where I go in and it's like there'll be there's one where there's this huge hemlock tree that's falling down, two of them, and they've got all these branches sticking off and they're across the river. And when I go in there to draw that, it's 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 really it's like it's hard. I have to stop several times. My brain capacity. That's the other thing. Is like you know I want to do like a a, a vista or a panoramic, but um, the, the, to keep it all on one piece of paper, you really uh, it's mm -hmm. too much of a challenge to mm -hmm. consider. Here's one where that I think that the economy is, you know, it's like, um, there's not, that you can't really tell what is what. And when I was drawing it, I couldn't tell. I knew there were a lot of dark trees against a lighter background. And there were, there's some birch trees, and then there were some hemlocks that had um, knots in them and stuff. And when I got done with it, I, I, I would have probably kept working on something like this, but I was like, wow, that, that feels like, to me, like, it conveys where what I'm sitting in front of as good as I could. So here I am painting this painting. <laughs> so I, I paint like these bigger paintings. I have a really small studio, um, so I, I do store these in there. But I like to paint outside when I can. And I'm out playing. It. So I think, and the, the, like, okay, so I think that now the progression is, these were about four or five years old, um, and they're, like, the process the same as the drawing inside, it's like I'll put a piece of color next to another piece of color to see what happens, and um, this one was, this, this painting was um, inspired by a dream that I had, and it, it, this is, like, almost photorealistic to me. Um, I, I, I think it was me flying across the sky and there was a village or something down below. And I, and I really like dreaming about, um, about things. One night I had a dream that I painted four magenta paintings and they were really, really intense magenta. And then when I woke up, I was like, I knew that they don't make a paint like that, so I couldn't really be inspired by the truth. <laughs> but I did find a magenta color and I bought it and the cap looked really good. I got a home and it looked like bubble gum. It was like,
I draw in the morning when I wake up. And if I don't draw in the morning, I don't have an, another dimension of experience that is so enriching. And that's what I'm getting looking at your stuff. <clears throat> it's like, it's, uh, oh God, it's beyond words. Um, it gives me another way of looking at my experience, my daily experience that isn't locked into my schedule and totally word-driven and goal driven. Mm -hmm. It makes it easier to go through a day when I have a, a wider spectrum mm -hmm. of appreciation like that. Driving down the road. You know, I get sad when the when the peak is over in the fall and the yellows and the reds are gone, but <clears throat> I'm driving around Portland and, and there's a after the peak of color. There's another phase, it's like they call it the rust phase, mm -hmm. and there was a whole bank of trees that must have been 100 yards long that was all lit by bright sunlight. It's all just browns. It was so beautiful. I wouldn't have seen that. I was on my way to work unless I'd drawn that day, and I'm just like, it made my life all that much nicer. Mm -hmm. That's what I get through. Yeah, and you know, I think that, like, just by going to places like when I go in the woods, I realize, wow. If I hadn't gone in the woods, I would never have the opportunity to get this photograph, you know, or, or whatever. Um, and then you see all these people posting pictures, you know, of sunrises in the morning. You know? They do it every morning, and it's like, wow, people are up that early. And then I get, it's nice I get the benefit to see what a sunrise looks like. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried it, but it's like really, really difficult. And you're going to get there like a half an hour before the actual sunrise comes out. Yeah. Um, yeah, Scott, Scott, you shared with me one time that you also played guitar in the yeah. Um, yeah. And when you told me that, I started doing that too. And it is like a really interesting way to transition into, you know, it's like, it's not like you just get up and, you know, when, just to hear, for me to be able to strum on my guitar, it makes that transition of going from sleep to coffee. Oh, it's better yeah, than coffee. coffee it's <laughs> it's making a, uh, an agreement with, with spirit or whatever that I'm going to dance today. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm tuning into the end. See, like your, your artwork to me is, is, is dancing. It's like when you, when you hear a piece of music that, you know, you, it's not like you go out and, and I know this move that you're just dancing. You hear a mu piece of music that moves you and you, you just, and that's what it is for yeah. me. It's like it's that agreement to, to be open and then just, yeah, go into that other place. Yeah. You know? yeah. Right, yeah. You're being directed by. Yeah, a lot of times, like when I'm painting, I try to um, I try to be as reductive as well. You know, you tr you kind of evolve, and right now where I'm at is I want to be reductive to not even like selecting a color, and not even and like each mark is like not thought and, it, and if i think that it shouldn't go there i'll actually put it there i'll be kind of intuitive and then and develop something along that line so that i have no idea where it is i don't know what i don't know how to identify it and i'm in a totally new place and i feel like that to me is like the most creative spot and it's the most compelling and it's probably the hardest to get to um in fact when i, I, I after i did like three paintings um i just been on break because there were it was like whoa i I kind of, my whole essence of my, my, I think it is my essence sort of like went to another place and I realized that it was okay that I didn't need to keep going there continuously. It was like, it was, it was, it was it sufficed. It just pacified me for, for a while. And then when I paint, I, 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 um, I just do these little scrubby things and I'm not like, um, they, they just, I don't know. So any so the process changes, but. But I feel like when you're in that realm of creativity and, and as you practice it, um, it's easy to get there really quick. And, and another thing I, I think I kind of would like to bring up is one time, you know, I don't, um, I'm very well aware that the Native Americans will um, call their ancestors when they're making their baskets and they're doing their, their needlework or work. And they'll use the hands of their grandfathers and their great grandmothers and as they're working. And I, and I know that that's always like, I feel like that's being able to draw on those things is really always um, available. And I've always resisted it. Because um, I went to Baptist Church and they told us not to mess around with what they call D 
<laughs> and, and, it, and it's kind of it's all right and i'm like yeah okay if i really wanted to do it i would but i was following this person on facebook for years his name was stephen watson he was from south portland and i didn't know him i never met him and um and he and he took photographs i only took photographs and they're really nice and they reminded me of mine um they didn't have a great camera and so i would be like oh, i wish i could get that guy a better camera and then he then one day announced on Facebook that he had a brain tumor and he was diagnosed at the stage four and he would be dying soon. And then his partner took over his Facebook thing and wrote a, he every day he would write on how Stephen was doing and and he and he posted on Stephen's pictures and it was and I, I was like wow it was it was um, I was really compelled to follow him and pray for him and um, and then he died. And so I went into my studio one day, and I looked at my Facebook, and it said Stephen passed away this morning or something. And and then and I was working on this painting, and I called it. Uh, it was called the painting was on Stephen Watson. It was a, it was dedicated to him. And then I was working on the painting, and all of a sudden my hands just started going. And whether it was my imagination or not, I was like, I knew exactly what was going on, and I felt like he'd taken over my hand, and he was working this part of the painting, which I had not been working at all. And so I, I, after that happened, I messaged his partner, and he said he was a, a, a clairvoyant, and he would always call people back to him, and he would reach out to people in the same way. He said that makes mm -hmm. sense. Mm -hmm. So that's the only time I've really ever I, I, I entertained that, and it was it was really significant. I felt like because I felt like he was just passing through. He, he, it was like he was on his way wherever he was going, and now he was a different type of a being, and he had this interaction, and and it, it was really profound and. And then, but then the weird thing was, is like two days later, I changed the painting, um, and it just was the painting was telling me that you know I was like so, um, so I didn't actually keep it the way that he had directed me. If that's what had happened. Mm -hmm. And we have after this, we have one, I think we have one last slide. <laughs> <laughs> and some people think that this is a fraud. And, 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 and. 1979. Yeah, 79. Those were the days, my friends. <laughs> I was living in the Gunkwit. I didn't know what I was going to do. I graduated from high school early and was in limbo. And so I was like the draw. So I went down there and I set up and did this plan of painting. <laughs> it's interesting to look at. <laughs> and that was my foundation. Mm. So, but as, you, as you look at it, can't you see beginning this painting and that? <laughs> I think so. I do. I can see it. I mean, it just almost looks, looks, you know, if you, if you soften well, up some of those shapes, it'd be a gold name. It's painted by the same guy. Yeah. 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 But, I, and I think that's <laughs> what it is. You have. You know, we each have our own. I like the color. Let's go see that. Yeah. Oh, I like that yeah. yellow relationship band. with being. Yeah, like, yeah. so, so that, would be, that would be relevant. That would be apparent. I, I think you 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 made that association quicker than I did, but um, I can I can definitely see it in some regards. Yeah. Yeah. Now, when you when you showed us all the photographs and then you showed us your drawings and you said you try to not think at all and let the puddles move. It's weird because you, you're saying something, but really that one where you said the puddles, letting them do whatever they want, it looked just like the photograph. It had the same sense of the photograph of the, the yeah, a lot of them where, I mean, even if well, you're I trying to, like, I felt like you were showing us how your art re is reflected from your photographs. Like it's a transition. Yeah. From, uh, yeah. I think even that, though you're saying you try to stay void yeah. while you're, but you, but you're, you are by the looks of it completely influenced by doing all that. It's it's all related. I mean, because yeah. it's coming from you. Yeah. I think I think when I go out, I look for things that evoke that that I become like evoked by, and there there's signal. Like the other day when I was um, taking photographs, I didn't put any in here, but. I, I was in the woods and I was like, I, I was, I walked for about half an hour and I was looking at everything and it, everything was just amazingly sensational. Sometimes, you know, you can go for a walk in the woods and, and like nothing's happening. 
And then I'm like, okay, this is something different. And it was the quality of the light. It was fall and the sun was going down. And it was the actual light, which is unusual for me. Usually it's like contrast and dynamics and stuff that I'm really compelled about. And then, and then, and, and so I, I tried to find it. I'm like, okay, I know my camera can't capture the light. It's like the light coming through all of the, the, um, the upper, the, the canopy. And we have um, those, uh, those uh, there are bugs that eat the hemlock trees. So all of the hemlock trees, or a lot of our hemlock trees, don't have a canopy anymore. And the light comes down like I've never seen it before because we've lived there for so long. It's always been like a, a dark primordial forest. And it was just kind of like this light area with these big tall trees going up. Um, and, I, and I knew that I couldn't get that light, but, but that was what I was identifying with. And I was like, wow, this is really making me feel like that is the thing. And then, so I tried to slow down enough to be able to get that. But I think that when I go out and I become like, it is a continuum and I look for certain things that intrigue and compel me. Um, and then that the light was uncharacteristic of that because it's never happened before. Um, so, but yeah, I, when I go out and I take a picture and I frame something, I'm like, oh, okay, I had enough courage to do this with my drawing and now I want to be able to do it with my camera. I want to be able to feel like, you know, it's, I have this, this is a dichotomy or something in me that says, don't take that picture because it's too cliche or something. It's like, when you walk into the woods and you see all this decaying birch on the floor, it's like, it could be just amazing. It's like hearing a really great symphony or something, but it's really cliche because people take pictures of birch all mm -hmm. the time. So then I'm like, okay, I don't want to take a picture. <laughs> but then I was listening to Rauschenberg the other day, and he's like, just do all the cliche stuff, you know? And I was like, yeah, like, why not, you know? So you break down that barrier, and so I did put a bridge picture in there tonight. Um, but I think that, yeah, yeah, go ahead. It is, it's, your process, what you seem to be describing, is like you're attempting to, to break down your, um, you know, we always have that ring pass knot of our consciousness, right? We, no matter what, we can't get out of our viewpoint, our, you know, we can cut down the trees, but there's more woods around it. Yeah, so but we can keep going. I but think. we can keep, so you can keep going, so it seems like, I, so no matter what, those trees, I mean the puddles that, that say what's up, are imbued into your sense yeah. when you when you paint it, so you, it seems like you're making like a conscious effort to not get too trapped by it and to yeah. See where you can well, I have this thing is, you know, you can build a craft. You, you know, like so, art. I think there's lots of different levels of art. And if you, you know, Kandinsky did this thing about the spiritual triangle, and like you've got the myriad of people down here that are buying like crafty kind of art, and then you've got the people that are more like the priests, and then you've got the very high priests. The very high priests, nobody knows who'd be like the Van Gogh or somebody that people just couldn't identify with at his time. So, um, I, I kind of feel like. As, I, as that craft develops, like when I'm drawing, then I, I can be real crafty and I can get really adept yeah. at, at making things look like things. And, but I really don't want to do that. I really want to like make, I want my, I want to move my soul. I want, you know, I want, mm -hmm. I want to have an experience that, um, that is like at least telling me that, wow, you have just, you have shifted some aspect of your inner being to a different level or a different place. And so that's like, so when I do something like hangs, it's like, I, I feel like that's what I've done. Um, and then it's like, okay, so now do I go back and do the same thing? Because, but, it, but it's not going to move my soul anymore. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be gratified by the accomplishment of the craft that I've developed. You know, and I'm really, I'm not interested in that. Um, mm -hmm. I make signs. And, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's crafty. Everybody wants an oval. And, you know, it's like, so, so that's the, the antithesis of, yeah. of having this feeling <laughs> of exhilaration of just of, of, of always trying to go to the, to the place you haven't mm -hmm. been before. Is it ever frightening? Yeah, because every time I, every time I'm putting down a piece of paint, I'm like, when I was working on this painting, every time that I was, when I when I got to here, I had I was like, you know, totally, I, I I was like, I didn't know, I, I had no idea of anything, I don't even know why I painted this, and so, but I got into that thing of where that I was like, totally unknowing, and then the color was picked randomly, and so I, I set it up so that I didn't know anything about it. And then when I, did, when I did that painting, I actually had a theme in mind, and my mother had passed away, and it was, it, was a, my, it was like my mother fleeting, but my mother was a very dark person in my life, and the painting didn't come out dark like my mother was, 
Um, but nonetheless, I did actually, I tried to follow that, that feeling of the darkness. And maybe she, I don't know. And that's a whole different philosophical thing. But maybe there was more light in your mom than you <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Recognized on the surface. <laughs> oh, yeah, so, so, it, so, yeah, so it's like then you do it, and then you can identify, well, you know, I don't know the two ostentations, but you can say, like, wow, Van Gogh, you know, he was really putting his heart and soul into it, and just nobody could relate to what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And everybody just thinks it's like, you know, it's, it's obvious. That's like when people when critic people when people say you know this painting doesn't work or that one does based on this criteria. I'm very leery of that because you know everybody was saying that about Van Gogh's work. Right. It just didn't work. It was just and now we look at it and we go, wow, that's like profound. It's like yeah. so how did that happen? And perception is so important. It's like if somebody tells you that something's good, you're more likely to believe it than if nobody says anything about it. Um, so there's that whole gamut too. Is like. You know, how much but, but you find yourself doing that. You 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 purposefully try to like challenge that challenge what works and if you think it works too well then you Yeah. You just yeah. Just run away from it or something. Yeah, I just spell it and I just I turn around and, and walk away. Yeah, another thing that you know like with photography that I found is like um it's real it, it works really well. You walk you know, Renoir said that the way to make the perfect um, flower painting is you, create, you get the best bouquet that you can, you make the best arrangement that you can, and then you walk around to the back side and you paint that side. And I always thought, wow, that's, I like that. That's, that's great. And so a lot of times when I'm out taking photographs, I, I'll be walking and I'm going, okay, look behind. And then I turn around and there it is. And it's like, it happens so often that that's the inspiration that's behind me. And then I go, oh, and I turn around again. And then it's like, wow, now this scene is equally compelling and inspiring. I find the rhythm consistent through it all. Rhythm? Your rhythm. Mm. My gesticulation also? Well, it, it, it all has the same rhythm. Oh, so like the same frequency? You know how like the Earth has a frequency that is at 432? <laughs> yeah, so... <clears throat> Human rhythm. Yeah, there's a certain rhythm that's always there. Yeah. I, I have to say something in, in support of Russell. There is a structural thing that you're doing that is going through all your work. I see it. I've known you. We went to school together. We lived together. And using a, a, a set of overt and subtle dynamics that are visual. And it's not easy to construct that way. It's very challenging. Like some of those wash drawings of the florist, it's like there's so much going on. And you allow it to go almost to the point of, you know, whatever it's called, entropic chaos, where it doesn't seem like anything. It's like a mess. It just holds. A, you know, they're, I've never seen anything drawing in the forest like that. They're, they're really refreshing. But you are using some really well-developed skills as a professional artist. It's not all... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and I try, but I do try to break away from it. And I, and I said, yeah. like, just by virtue of going to the palette and mixing paint, you're stuck. Okay, what are you going to do? And then, like, okay, well, I'll just go out and, and I actually go out and I just pile sticks up sometimes, but just to break away from even that pattern of mixing the paint. And then you have to walk up to the painting and you're stuck with that too. And then you have to do something, you have to respond. <laughs> so it's like, you know, so I can't be free of it all. And then, so I have these prescribed mannerisms or ways of doing those things mm -hmm. and I'm stuck and, <laughs> and I don't know what to do about it. But that's the whole, that's the whole challenge in life, yeah. right? I mean, you know, um, you, uh, set down, you know, if you want to pick a cake from scratch first you must invent the universe. You know, so I mean, you can't get away from what your training, from what you're like. That's what that's the recognizable aspect of this painting, with your other ones. But what you're doing, it seems, is it's so it's always that struggle to get to the essence. It's it's, it's a Buddhist yeah. thing of like, yeah. you know, they don't say like, um, let go of everything, and and then never pick it up again. They say, let go of everything, and then when you pick it up, you're not attached to it. You can see it in a different way. You know, it seems like that's what you I like that. I like that. Uh, so, so Carl Jung, um, when he was teaching his, uh, his um, students who wanted therapists, uh, he told them, learn everything you can about symbols, and then forget it all. 
<laughs> I think that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, the yin and yang is like crazy too. You know, that's uh, a lot of times I just refer to that. And like, okay, you know, this is just the opposite side of that. And then, and sometimes I actually do really enjoy, you know, I don't like to mix colors to make something like, you know, this is whole thing about color, colorists and people that are really good with colors. And I like to, uh, more recently, I like to avoid that and really just go for the, um, it's like the meat of the situation rather than make something that looks beautiful. You know, mm -hmm. I think the beauty is inherent in, in it, and it's going to come out anyways if it is. You and mean you're not planning a triad? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.